have questions and you want answers. Welcome to the Q&A show. Thank you for joining us for this program. It's a special program. Why? Because we've got a special person with us. Uh, it is Dr. Grady McMurtry again. <laughs> Thank you. I'm very glad to be here again. <laughs> well, we've got lots of questions that we need to get through, so yes. I'm not going to delay any and start some of these uh, questions that have been coming in uh, over the weeks as well and days because uh, you've been here, what, a week? Going on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, you'll be going back to America, then on to Russia. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, Dr. Grady, uh, you're always a blessing to our viewers, and they do appreciate it. Well, so, thank you, got to start thank with some of the questions straight away, and, that, and it's great because you know we've got an hour to get through these, but we just want to really concentrate on it to get the most out of you, for our viewers' sake. Uh, your ministry in, uh, in Creation Worldview Ministries. Well, what is a worldview, and did you name your ministry that way? Says the uh, question. Why did I? Yes. Um, a worldview is like a lens through which you see the world. So I have, I'm wearing glasses right now, and so a worldview is like this lens. But the shape, the prescription of the lens, of course, is dependent upon my, my needs at the moment. But in terms of a worldview for a person, your lens prescription is shaped by whether you believe in evolution or creation. So that if you believe in evolution, this causes the shape of your lens to be such that when you look through it, you see things from that evolutionary world view, so it's that lens. If you believe in creation, then that changes the shape of your lens. So for instance, I was an evolutionist, so I had a prescription that was one shape, then I became a Christian and then a creationist, and so my, the shape of my lens changed. So when you look through the evolutionary lens at the world, you say, well, uh, you know, lawlessness, racism, pornography, they're fine. When you look at it through a creation lens, you say it's wrong and you know why because you, you've read the Bible, you know what God's Word says about these things. And so, although I'm a biblical scientific creationist, and, and almost everything I do has to do with creation science, the fact of the matter is that we are stressing a Christian biblical worldview. And we stress Christian biblical because Jews have a biblical worldview. Theoretically, uh, based on the first uh, 11 chapters, 12 chapters of Genesis, uh, Muslims have a creation worldview. And so uh, we are stressing a Christian biblical worldview, that the Bible is our sole authority in all things, but, but good science matches what the Bible says. And that's why our ministry is creation worldview ministries. Mm. Now, does that, have, uh, does that make room then for empathy for others who, like yourself at one time, and they might be this way still, have a worldview on uh, evolution? Well, see, that's just it. Uh, having been in that world, having been a teacher of evolution, having been willing to learn, therefore willing to change, and changed, then I have an empathy for them that they also need to change too, and that they just need to be educated to this. I, I, I think personally now that any scientist who is genuinely seeking truth will eventually become a Christian if they have enough time. You know, I, I can't say that they will always do it because they might die too young to, to finish the process. But if they will genuinely seek truth, I believe that they will eventually become Christians because that is the truth, and Jesus himself as a person is the truth. That's John 14, 6. Well, that's a, that's a great view of, of those that are not in the same camp as you are right now. Um, and thank God that you uh, did have a, a change of heart and Amen mind. Amen to that. Yeah. <laughs> Next question that's coming. Uh, you say that Big Bang has been disproven. Uh, why and by whom? Good question. Well, as a matter of fact, on, on our website at creationworldview.org, there's a set of articles, almost all of them at the popular level, so people don't have to think it's all just hard science. It's, it's easy to understand things. And there I have an article that evolutionists have disproved the Big Bang. It's interesting, uh, as a matter of fact, what's going on uh, even this year. Uh, but evolutionists disproved the Big Bang. The whole concept of the Big Bang is only about 100 years old. Uh, it was never proven. There are various versions of it. But the whole concept was around when Hubble found the red shift in the universe, uh, that the idea that the redder the light, the farther away it was kind of a thing. But but recent research, and we're talking about less than 15 years, uh, has shown that the, the redshift isn't smooth. You know, it, it, if there was a continuous expansion, then the redshift curve ought to be a smooth curve. I see. However, what we find is that the redshift is not. Now, the scientific term for it is it's quantized. But what that means is we find redshift at specific 
distances. And these distances repeat. So you have this distance, this distance, then you go back to this one, then back to that. And so what it's like, it, it's like the redshift is like shells. You know, if you were to cut through something where you, you had a, a golf ball inside a hard baseball, inside a soft baseball, inside a soccer, football, mm -hmm. uh, yes. basketball, and then you cut through it, you would see rings on the inside, just like tree trunk. Mm -hmm. And so the redshift light is actually like the rings. It's like sh concentric shells. Is this shells. in the universe or in a galaxy? It's <clears throat> well, in it's the in the shift. universe. Mm -hmm. and, and two things are very important. Number one, this, this proves the Big Bang concept. Okay, so you, the shells in specific repeating distances shows intelligence. It can't be random. So that proves a creator God. Number two, it disproves the Big Bang because it's not a smooth curve. Third, it proves what the Bible says. The Bible says that the earth is at the center of the universe. Now, of course, we would say from a supernatural standpoint, spiritually, it is, you know, the center of God's activity. But now we know it's physically at the center of the universe too. And that, that is what the Bible actually says in the Word because uh, we could not exist at the center of our galaxy. Uh, radiation, gravity would kill us. So God stuck us out on the edge of our galaxy inside a spiral arm so we're protected, but we have a great view of the universe. The heavens declare the glory of God and we have a great viewpoint. Mm -hmm. However, if I were to use the word center, it does have different meanings, doesn't it? Uh, center forward. <laughs> well, yeah, there you go. That's a, his mind works this yeah. way, folks. <laughs> but, I'm but, on but the ball. But, but think with me. There is a geographical center to London, mm -hmm. but it isn't necessarily the center of That's commerce. Right. It's not exactly the center of politics. I mean, you know, Parliament being the center right. of politics uh -huh. right? uh, for the country, but it's not the center for the city and so forth. And, and if I'm in that that area right down there along the Thames, uh, you know, from from towers and so forth up to, say, Parliament, you would say I was in the center of town. Mm -hmm. But it isn't necessarily well, geographical. Well, you've got the center. city centre, you've got the, the That's finance centre, you've got the parliament. Uh, exactly. And so and when the White sign Hall says, and all of that. When the sign yeah. says two city centre. Okay, I get If you. I'm anywhere within that area, you would say I was in the centre of town. Mm -hmm. But it's not the geographical centre. No. So, and, and so we use the word centre in different ways. Now, what this proves is that our galaxy is at the centre of the universe. You see, evolutionists want to say the universe is infinite and has no centre, that we're not special. But we are special because we are at the center of the universe. But d they won't recognize that, though, those that uh, well, have a world view. Will they, they won't recognize it as a world view, necessarily. Because they think there's more out there than, and they don't want to believe in a God anyway, so why right. would that be the center of his will and purpose? Exactly. But since we are at the center, it proves that he does exist, and we are at the center of his purposes. So, you see, we have this conflict in view where they see the science, but they refuse to change. Have you really answered the question, uh, maybe the why, but by whom uh, has well, it been Well, what I said was it was evolutionists who are responsible for almost all of this research. So when you read okay. the articles, I have the citations and I talk so the about them. So the Higgs So they then thought, now what's interesting about what's going on right now in science is this. Many, many major evolutionists who used to believe in the Big Bang or one of the various mm -hmm. scenarios of the Big Cut, there were more than one, uh, have now abandoned the Big Bang because they can't fix it. There's too many problems, too many holes in it. So what they've done is they've gone back to the position that they used to have. And you know what that position is? Well, it's just eternal. Is it? Okay. All right. All right, so I hope that answers uh, some of the points that you wanted to get out of that question. What is your position on global warming and climate change? This is very... Uh, appropriate right now to be talking about this because oh, you've had a particular gracious. stance that you've been ridiculed for. Oh, I've, I've been I've been writing for decades. Uh, I'm a very proud global warming, global climate change denier. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Earth has been cooling for about the last 20 years, roughly. Uh, somebody could go to uh, spaceweather.com, not my site. Uh, but there you can see every day. Uh, the number of sunspots on the sun. Right now there's a one tiny one as, as we're talking, but, but it changes. Let me have a look. Yes. Ah, yes. Oh, yes. You I can see, see it from here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Actually, you did show me some. Eye, fine very eye. Very good, yes. Uh, oh, well, there was another one. But <laughs> the fact of the matter is that, that the sunspot activity has been continuously going down and down and down. Now, it, it goes up and down in cycles, but the cycles themselves have been getting shorter and shorter. And right now, uh, this year, next year, we're going to be at the point of what's called a solar minimum. 
where the sunspot activity will be basically zero or almost in zero. So that'll mean it won't be quite so hot. <clears throat> and that means that the Earth is slowly. Now this is not day-to-day -day weather. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not month-to-month -month weather we're talking about, about over the years. But the Earth is slowly cooling, and we're about to reach God, the bottom point. I feel yes. it as well. Yeah, I was going to say. so cold. <coughs> yeah. Uh, Howard could be used as a thermometer, believe me. Yeah. Um, however, so, the, the point here is... So it's not that, global warming, as they it, used to call it. Well, as that's we, just it. When they were talking Al about... Al Gore kept first came yeah, out with it, right? Well, Dear Al Gore wouldn't know science if it walked up and hit him. Yeah. Uh, the, well, that's the, a big thing. <laughs> well, my theory, anyway. Don't tempt me. Okay, I would. Don't tempt me. But the fact of the matter is, when they were talking about, in the 70s, global cooling, they said, we're all going to freeze to death. It was <laughs> irreversible. We were all going to die. This is the late 70s. At that point, they suddenly realized that, in fact, sunspot activity was going up. The Earth was actually getting warmer. It was demonstrable, scientific data. Mm -hmm. And they had to switch from global cooling to global warming. So for the last few decades, they've been talking about global warming. Now they realize it's not true. So what have they done? They've gone to, we're going to prevent climate change. Right, that's a good word now, for here's, it, because here's, it's a compromise, isn't it? It's neither cold nor hot, it's just change. Well, I, it's not the word I would use, but nonetheless. Okay. <laughs> the, what would you but, call it? Normal, cyclical. First of all, climate change is normal. It is natural. The, the thing to worry about is if you didn't have climate change, if you didn't have climate change on a regular continuing basis, just ups and downs that are normal and natural, if you didn't have that, it would be like the Earth being dead. But isn't there, well, okay, so there's, there seems to be a lot of flooding recently, especially in the United Kingdom. We, we've suffered the last few winters, which just seems like village and, after village have been absolutely me. deluged. Yeah, but, but, but forgive me, that's part of the global cooling scenario. Why? Because weather patterns actually tend to remain roughly the same, but the problem is that the patterns themselves shift from east to west on the globe, depending on whether it's warmer or colder. This is why you talk about El Nino, La Nina in the Pacific, South Pacific, okay? So the, the weather patterns actually remain very similar year to year, but they shift from east to west by global warming and global cooling. And so, if it was rainy here for a few years and dry here as the climate shifts from the warming to cooling over a few years, all of a sudden the rain will now be in this area and the other area will be dry. I mean, think about what happened in California. Uh, you know, they were in drought oh, and then yeah, suddenly they was... got inundated. Mm. Well, it's simply because the weather patterns shifted. They, they didn't really change, but they're just shifting in their position on the earth based on warming and cooling, whether it's warmer in the western South Pacific near Australia or whether it's cooler. That's the really big thing that you have to look for. Now, only God can predict these things. Scientists can measure them, you know, present, past, we measure as we go along, but we cannot predict that the sunspots are going to come back. And there have been times when they didn't. Here in England, between 1800 and 1830, there were two very low, in terms of height, uh, sunspot cycles. And that's when you had frost fairs on the Thames. That's when you were selling hot crust buns uh, on top of the ice and so forth. Were you there? And uh, I've seen the pictures. Okay. But seriously, uh, the Thames but, but very froze seriously, over, didn't but it? Very seriously. And then they started to get a little warmer, a little warmer. And we came out of what was called the Little Ice Age about 1895. Now, the Little Ice Age lasted from approximately 1300 to near 1900. My goodness. Now, first of all, wouldn't you think it would be a little warmer right now? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, these global warming alarmists. Wouldn't you think it'd be a little warmer right now if we just came out of the Little Ice Age? Mm -hmm. And we've had five fluctuations since 1895, but nothing real deep. The problem is, the next time, it could be deep again. Um, what about the oceans? I just want to add that one in there myself. You know, the, the oceans, they say, are the ice is melting to such a degree that it could cause uh, major problems. I was reading uh, last night that some of the bacteria that's been, let, you know, frozen over and is now being released. Out of permafrost and so forth. Yeah, permafrost, yeah. that's right. Yeah, and ancient, now, ancient uh, bacteria that were sealed there. And yes, all that kind of thing. Yeah. which could be devastating to mankind now. It, it could be. You know, I think, I think the, the alarmists are using this. Uh, to try to push their political agendas for the most part. But that doesn't mean that there isn't some validity to the argument. You know, yeah. I myth, mean, myth always starts in reality. Right. I mean, um, some of the, some of the uh, 
bugs, if you like, as well, that were frozen, that some of the animals, and that now when they, uh, they, I suppose, they're exposed to the sunlight, and uh, they're, they're getting to a situation where those uh, bacteria can actually be released into the atmosphere and cause oh, I, I uh, can give you a devastation. Great, oh, I can give you a great example. Uh, very recently, Russia had to kill a quarter million reindeer because of an infection from a corpse that there you go, exactly, you see. So, I, oh, I mean, I'm very well aware yeah. of these things. Okay. And of course, I go to Russia, too, but, yeah. uh, but I understand that. So there, there, there are, I was, when I was reading last night, I was thinking, I really need to be talking to Dr. Grady about this, but it was the early hours of the morning, so... Thank you for not waking yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. But um, it is worrying. I mean, the, the plague and or bubonic plague and all sorts of other things and anthrax. Uh, what, I don't know. What else? Is anthrax a man-made... Disease, or oh no, it's it's natural. a natural, but okay. we can fabricate it. But if they're that's all the, going to come out of the thing permafrost, that's the uh, you know, we can make some of these things. We don't even have to have them around in nature. All right. Uh, they've been weaponized. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, there's some legitimacy to this, but it's blown totally out of proportion by extremists who are simply pushing political agendas. Now. Yes, there are glaciers that are melting, but what they don't tell you is that there's also glaciers that are increasing in size. That the ice in the Antarctic uh, is actually thicker now than it used to be. Uh, the ice in the, in the Arctic comes back and forth every summer and every winter, but, but there's actually more ice in the Antarctic now than there has been. And the temperature at the South Pole has been falling since 1957. Um, you talked about the oceans. Now, oceans do warm and cool, but the oceans are in a continuous cooling process because after the flood of Noah, tremendous amounts of hot water were added to the ocean, and the oceans in general have been cooling ever since, radiating more heat. Um, Al Gore was talking about how because of global warming we were going to get more and more hurricanes. Well, I live in Orlando. I've been hit by hurricanes. But the fact of the matter is, when you look at the statistics that we only have since 1850, the number of hurricanes and their severity is actually going down. Goodness. So it's the alarmists because the, that are... Because the alarmists are, are making these have stories. Have an agenda. They, they are fairy tales. What is tales. their agenda, would you say? It is political. It, uh, global warming, climate change, and these kinds of things are part of a political agenda, primarily to push socialism and communism into government. Mm. Well, it's definitely to take more money from us, that's for sure. Well, exactly, because they, they say since man's the problem, then government's the only fix. <laughs> I would rather I think rely it's the other God. way around, isn't it? Yeah, I would rather rely on God. Yeah. You deal a lot with uh, creation versus evolution from science, but how does the acceptance of one or the other affect areas of life like art or music? Does it? Yeah, uh, people tend question? to forget. Uh, remember I, I said a worldview. Mm -hmm. It's like a lens through which you see the world, correct? And the shape of the lens is based upon creation and evolution. Now, I'll try, it's, you're a musician, we both know that very well, and so does the audience. Uh, you're an excellent drummer. Um, Thank you. So let's think about this. How does that worldview affect areas of humanities, such as the arts, yeah, which we're yeah. talking about paintings mm -hmm. or music and so forth? Think back with me. Now, regardless of your personal taste, I mean, you, you like this, you like that. Yeah. But regardless of your personal taste, just looking at the history of art, the history of music for a moment, when, when would you say was the single greatest moment of human history when it came to, say, art or music? Uh, well, when it comes to art, wouldn't you say the Renaissance? Mm-hmm. Okay, so you, you oh, have... Michelangelo uh, as well. Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, mm, yeah. uh, Botticelli, and, and so forth. Mm. Uh, I mean, magnificent, oh, magnificent yes. things. Okay. I mean, the, the art is just phenomenal, right? I mean, even if it's not your taste. But we don't really have that sort of but, but, art well, talent that's, today that's, like that. That's just it. That's so my point. So form. if we look at art 500 Bricks years ago, it really pinnacled. Car tires and things like that. Because the art was all about honoring God. Of course it was, wasn't right? it? Especially Michelangelo. Yeah. Exactly. And, and Da Vinci and so forth. Mm. Uh, these guys were, were, were glorifying God or God's creation. Mm -hmm. um, in their art 500 years ago. But then what happened? The Sistine Chapel, wasn't it? Well, the Sistine mm -hmm. Chapel, of course. Uh, but, but think about what happened. As the Renaissance faded, that quality of art faded because then you would get to the Grand Masters. Now, they're, they're very good, technically speaking, don't, don't get me wrong. But you're going to go into to the Great Masters, mm -hmm. uh, such as the, the Night Watch, for instance. 
uh, and, and you're going to get to the Rembrandts and, and really Constables. excellent artists, really excellent artists, and mm -hmm. they're, they're working with shadows and this kind of thing. Um, but from there, you're going to continue. If you'll notice, you're no longer honoring God or honoring God through his creation. You're starting to concentrate on man. Unless you were constable. <laughs> so I've got to get him in. And as you go, lovely country scenes. Oh, yes. You know, well, I, I was English going, to, country I, I'm going in that general direction. Mm -hmm. But as the, master, the great masters yeah. and their disciples kind of fade out of the picture, uh, you start to get into, Abstract. well, we're doing pastorals and uh, portraits and so forth, uh, where finally you get into the 1800s. And in the 1800s, you start getting uh, not the art of really what's reality. You start getting oh, into, <laughs> well, you start getting into things like Impressionists, mm -hmm. where you no longer paint the real thing. You paint an impression of the real thing. So that at a distance, you can tell what it is. But if you look up close, it's just a bunch of dots, you yep. know, kind of thing. Um, and, and from the Impressionists, it, by the end of the 1800s, you're going to get to people like Picasso in his, in his first periods. Um, but you will then go into Cubism, Surrealism with Dali. Uh, and finally, and I hate to say this because it's in the United States, but finally, a few years ago, art was a, a chimpanzee throwing art balls at a canvas and selling for $3,000 a piece to support the zoo. Mm -hmm. It was the keeper. Now, and, and remember, in between, we have people like Andy Warhol, who would paint I a canvas one going. single color, right. or he would paint a Campbell's soup can and mm -hmm. sell it for horrendous prices. Mm -hmm. And, and forgive me, uh, I don't mean to offend anybody in the audience, but I, I really don't like going to modern art museums because you walk in and here's three brass balls stuck one on top of the other and a brass plaque that says that this is Madonna and Child. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I'm sorry, no, it's not. <laughs> so you think they're prob that's more of an evolutionist mindset? Uh, that's evolution applied and a to godless one art. That. And yeah. the same thing can be said of music. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about the greatest art uh, of music, Handel, mm -hmm. Bach, Beethoven, mm -hmm. but then you're going to get to waltzes by the Strauss brothers, mm -hmm. and uh, you're going to go through Mozart, who technically is superb, but it isn't the same thing as the Bach, the Beethoven, the Handel. Then, as again, as you go through art, uh, I'll start through music here, uh, you continue to see a degrading it when it has less concentration on God and more concentration on man. So when it gets to heavy metal, you really, well, you've had it, have you? See, that's just it. In the 1900s, what happened? Music started to have to be reverberated, flanged, tanked. I mean, you know about all these mm. music terms. Uh, and, and distorted. I mean, in the 1800s, it went to ragged time, ragtime. Mm -hmm. So music was now out of tempo. It was no longer precisely in tempo. It went out of tempo. Scott Joplin. Yeah, Josh Joplin, uh, for instance, a great practitioner of it. And jazz, which was a loose form. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, people feel like it, that's fine. But I'm simply pointing out that this is an evolutionary worldview applied to music over the time frames where you're getting less and less away from glorifying God and it starts to go out of time, it starts to have to be, come noise instead One of sound. One break there. I, I think blues was something that uh, was something that came out of uh, the suppression and persecution of uh, the black communities that were in the slave trade, and their only hope was in God, and you heard a lot of that in the music. Well, but again, the, 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 spirituals, the spirituals of that time we're concentrating on God because, mm -hmm. again, and, and I would say that this is the same thing as when I went to Russia initially. When you have a spiritual vacuum or when you have no material resources of your own, the only thing you can rely upon is the supernatural. Mm. Okay, well, gosh, that was a long answer to that question. Sorry. Um, uh, the Winter Olympics are about to start, and is there anything about uh, watching them? You know. Interesting question. Well, I, I myself was at the 1960 Winter Olympics in Squaw Valley. And at that time, I was still an evolutionist. And, and I absolutely believe we, we ought to be, every one of us ought to be proud of our country. We ought to be proud of our athletes. We should root them on in competitions, as long as they're fair competitions, mind you. Um, you know, I don't want to see people competing hyped up on some drug. But, but when it comes to the Olympics, one has to remember that it was a religion. Initially, it was a religion called the religion of the athlete. 
So when we go back to ancient Greece and, and the original Olympic Games, it was a religion. Now, of course, the games died. Then, when the Comte de Coupetin brought the games back into existence in the late 1800s, he said it was a religion. Really? Yes, sir. And when he Who were they worshipping? Gods? Plural? Yes, the Greeks, of course, were a, a pantheon mm -hmm. of gods. And so the religion of the athlete it was actually a religion. When the Coupe de Coupetin died and it was turned over to the man, um, um, yes, his name's the only one, uh, Averidge, um, when he took over, he said in writing it was a religion. Mm. So my point is, yes, I think we ought to be proud of our nations. I think, you know, whatever nation you're part of, I think you ought to be proud of your athletes. I think you ought to root them on, and, and I don't see a problem with that. Yeah. Although I'd like to see them root just as loud for God sometime. But, but we have to remember that in the Olympics, it really is based initially, originally, in a religion. Okay. And that we have to be very careful about separating the, the sports activity with anything that has to do with a theological yeah. view. Well, mind you, uh, modern day footballers, when they score, they yeah. usually <coughs> pray Some God. do, okay. some do. And they even bow or pray before. I know one of the Chelsea players uh, does that. And, well, and same you know, thing so, in American football yeah. and, and uh, whatever. We do have, uh, you know, religious athletes, certainly, mm -hmm. but some of them don't because they don't think there is any super, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's a spectrum. Um, another, example really for me of uh, where there's a break there which was I was watching the film only recently it's been out many 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 years and that's Chariots of Fire and of course the yeah I love it Abrams it's a great movie, yeah. yeah and also Eric the Little. Christian Eric Little yeah. fantastic where they honored God well at least Eric Little did too. Eric Little did yeah absolutely Beyond a wouldn't run on the Sabbath and uh, the, even the King of England came to him and said look you know Please run on the Sabbath. You know, yeah, you, he said he we need you, it. and he wouldn't do it. The, the old Rex, Lex, Lex, Rex. Yes, yeah. and that was lovely because the man who was, uh, uh, who should have uh, perhaps he run against, uh, he couldn't. Little had to wait till the next race or something on the Monday rather than the Sunday, and uh, one of the guys is in the movie, whether it is in real life or not, I don't know. The American comes up to him and says, and gives him a little note to Eric Little and says, "He who honors God." honors the man. Oh you know? no, the characters I, were real. Yeah, and it's, that's a beautiful story because it was uh, used for the benefit of, um, well, not just the man, but also of praising God as well and honoring God. Absolutely. Uh, okay, so we're getting uh, through the program quite quick, uh, so, but we're getting very slow on these questions. Uh, well, the next one is asked here, we are Christians. Why don't we just major on spiritual things? A good, good point here. Why do we need to bother with science? You know, so maybe we're a bit too lazy, but, um, but or the mass or anything. Because we're Christians, we just believe. So why, why do we need to be bothered about, you know, the great science and everything and about the, you know, what's gone on in the universe and the beginnings and, you know, or, I don't know. Is it, is, it, is it worth us as Christians getting into? I would say it is because we need to, well, be able no, to speak there, and relate to those people who, who have that intelligence there, in, a, in there, a simple way. How do we approach that? Yeah, there are many Christians who, who simply say faith is enough. And, and for them, faith is enough. Yeah. I, I want to make that stipulation. And if, if the Bible is all you need and rely on it, that's great. Okay. But it is recorded in Mark that there were Pharisees listening to Jesus as he was teaching. And one young man, a scribe, came up and asked him, which commandment is the greatest commandment of all? Now Jesus answered his question, but he didn't say anything new. He quoted Moses in Deuteronomy. And he said, the first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God, the great Shema of Deuteronomy. And then he goes on to say this, Again, quoting Moses, he's not saying anything new. You, you shall worship the Lord your God with all of your, and I, I'm uh, a loose translation here, with all your spirit, your innermost being, with all of your soul, your emotion and will, and then he says with all of your mind, that you shall worship God in all three areas. And then he goes on to say, and you shall, and he continues. Now, think about this for a second. We're very good at worshiping God in spirit. 
typically we're very good at worshiping God with our emotion and our will, certainly. But my challenge to many people on occasion is, when was the last time you worshiped the Lord your God with all your mind? Mm. So it might be a little bit uncomfortable for some see, people see, to most use people, it. See, most people don't. They're, they're yeah. fine with the spirit, they're fine with the emotion and so forth. They don't want to do the research or whatever. But, but Jesus put a tremendous emphasis, and, and think about this, it is the church that has always traditionally been over centuries and centuries the bastion of intellectual activity. The great universities of the world came from Christianity. The scientific method was established by creation believing scientists who were Christians. When you go back to Bacon, you go back to Isaac Newton, uh, Boyle, Faraday, Maxwell, mm. uh, Louis Pasteur, and uh, our George Washington Carver, for instance, or our Benjamin Franklin, by the way, who was our first creation scientist in the United States. Uh, when you go back to them, they are the ones that establish the scientific method. They are the ones that establish universities around the world. Uh, the great intellectual activity came from the church. And the, the, the thing I lament is that we no longer do. Mm. But for the average guy or woman in the street, to try and approach somebody of, the, of a greater intelligence than themselves it is intimidating a bit. So that's why they're saying probably this <coughs> question is put, you know, why do we need to bother? And I think we do because I, I want to be able to reach other people, but I need it in a concise, what? simple form that I can remember. What, what happened to study to show yourself approved? Yeah, that's a Yes, I mean, wow. yes, we study yeah, the Bible and we approve to, to learn yeah. our theology and to understand God's laws. But when you go back to the creation mandate of Genesis chapter 1, we are to study what God did in order to benefit others. Mm. That's a very good scripture. Yeah, so we, we should be... Uh, making the effort at least, yeah. yeah, doing some research. And you don't have to be intimidated. Mm. Somebody who's not had any more than an eighth grade education can in absolutely blow a PhD out of the water mm. if they just know a few basic things. Which would you say is the most basic and the most well, uh, best uh, to, for us as a layman to, to use? Well, it's very hard for me because I know so many. <laughs> it's just, you know, that's a, hard to pick out the one out of the many. But the fact of the matter is, uh, <laughs> if you simply had a basic understanding of the first and second law of thermodynamics. And yes. I know that's a big scientific term. Yeah. But, but if you only had a basic understanding, and I mean just a basic, mm -hmm. you don't have to understand physics at any great depth. They tell us the universe cannot be the reason for its own existence, that it could not have evolved into existence, and it tells us it's not eternally old. I mean, it tells us lots of things. Try to get some evolutionist to give you a reasonable, rational, science-based answer to refute that, to promote evolution. They can't do it. Give us that example in layman's terms, you know. Okay. Third, okay, <coughs> third law of it is, it's very, It's very simple, really. Okay. First law says you start with 100%, you end with 100%. It says nothing can be created nor destroyed. Right. It's Isn't that interesting that that's a scientific law that says nothing can be created nor destroyed? Wow. Right? Well, that's ridiculous. So it used the words creation in the law. Mm -hmm. Einstein, E equals MC squared. You can take energy, make mass, mass, make energy. You don't lose anything. You start with 100%, you end with 100%. Therefore, the universe could not have evolved from something less. It could never have evolved into existence. Okay, so it they had to against start their own laws, whole then. and complete as 100%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The second law says that in every transformation, every time you and I do something, we lose something. You we lose, lose a bit of You lose some of the energy as random heat energy mm -hmm. that you cannot reach out, collect it back, and put it back inside. You know, you are here, and believe me, folks, yes. Howard gets cold in a breeze yes. at oh, 90 a lot degrees. of energy. Uh, but, but you're sitting there, and your body is losing heat. You, you can feel it. Yeah, I know. Right? Can you reach back? out into the air, grab it and stick it back in your mouth again? No. No. Can you take the heat that comes out of your exhaust pipe in your car, put it right back around into the engine and keep running? Not yet. No. <laughs> you have to keep filling the tank, right? right? So the second one says, yes, you start with 100, you end with 100. But you start with 100 and you end with 80 plus 20. Mm -hmm. The 20 is no longer available for useful work. So the next time you start, you start with 80 
as you, knew, as you knew, 100. Yes. The 20 right. didn't cease to exist, right. but it's now no longer available for further use for work. And so the universe is running downhill. Everything is deteriorating because of human sin in the garden. Everything, biological or physical, is decaying. So what's the third law? The third law, well, the third law is what's usually referred to with um, life only reproduces after its own kind sort of thing, that life only comes from life and only reproduces after its own kind. It's sometimes called the third law. Mm -hmm. But that life only comes from life, that, that rocks cannot become alive by random chance, that dead things don't become alive, and that once they're alive, they only reproduce, that cows only produce cows. You see a variation within cows, or people only produce the people, and there's, a, and there's a variation within people, but the one kind only reproduces its own kind. It doesn't change into another kind, and so it also refutes evolution. Okay, that's very important, but there are uh, variations that we do see in a species, but, but up that's, to a point. <clears throat> that's built-in variation that God actually designed. It's like dogs. Well, again, you can go from Chihuahuas to Great Danes and yeah. whatever. But it's but the dog still family. Dogs. Yeah. And the more we know about science, the laws of, again, the laws of genetics prevent evolution from happening. The laws of genetics prove that creation is true, that, that God built in variation because he doesn't want us to all look the same. Why would he want to look at everybody and say, oh, you all look alike? But, but the fact of the matter is tremendous variations that allow us to shift gene frequencies within a gene pool, but you can't go out over the edge. It will not become something else. Like a mule. Well. A mule is the end of the line. Is that, am I right there? Be, be careful. The Some mules are fertile. Okay. So yeah, of course. Some mules can right. reproduce, so okay. that's not a, that's not quite Hasn't true. Hasn't quite dropped off. But we do know that zebras, mules, horses are all the same kind. They can all interbreed. How can uh, believe, I believe in the Bible when it says people live to be 900 years old? This is, people don't really understand uh, this mm -hmm. one, do they? Because they think that's well, that's poppycock. I can't even believe if that's what it says in the Bible. I don't don't accept anything it says. Well, that's just it. You know, the Bible says things that people in, in the secular world have problems with. You know, you can't believe it's only 6,000 years old. You can't believe in the ark. And one of the things it says, oh, you can't possibly believe that people live to be 900 years old. Mm. Now, before the flood, with the exception of taking out Enoch, who went alive to heaven, and one guy, Lamech, who died young at 770, the men averaged 912 years old. Now, that's 10 times longer than today, and people struggle with that issue. Uh, I would tell you that I don't know when Revelation might replay it, but I did do a program for Revelation, and I have a DVD available on our website about how people could medically and scientifically live to be over 900 under the environmental conditions that existed prior to the flood. And there are 19 medical and scientific things which taken in combination would allow it. It's not one, it's the combination. But we started with perfect genetic information. We had perfect uh, digestive systems, perfect immunity systems. We had perfect food. Um, you know, it, we started in perfection. Now, you've got no place to go up from perfection. You can only go down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so we had, we had a much stronger magnetic field. No matter where you look, we see that if you do study the problem, that there are 19 scientific medical reasons that would have allowed this. We only live one-tenth as long as people used to. And that's because of human sin in the garden starting the decay process. The decay process was sped up by the flood of Noah, and we're continuing the decay process right now. I, I hate to tell people in some of my presentations, but we now know from genetic studies we are losing one to two percent of our genetic information per generation. Right, but so fortunately, we're continuously getting worse. Right. So, as a Bible believer. Yeah, you say well, we've been here 6,000 years. Yes. How many generations does that equate to? Approximately 250. Oh, I thought you'd know the answer to that one. Yes, sir. Well uh, obviously, it would vary by individual, but, but mm. we have had 6,000 years, and of course, uh, generations were much longer before the flood. But when you really look at history, we are at approximately the 250th generation per person, and we ought not to be here. Mm. So L Literally, we shouldn't because be Because of the information we've lost. Because of the information we've lost, the decay of the systems, but we exist today because God, in his foreknowledge, put little machines in our DNA, in the DNA of other creatures, that repairs some of the damage, mm -hmm. 
And, and so it won't repair big things like hemophilia, you know, sickle cell anemia. But it does, does correct some of the, the other mistakes. But our it, immune system is, is breaking down. Yeah, our immune it? system is breaking down. Our digestive system mm. is breaking down. All of our biological systems are breaking down. And the food that we eat is worse because so it's breaking down. So would that account for the increase in cancer? Uh, the increase in cancer has to do with some of these things. I mentioned the uh, decay of the Earth's magnetic field. Mm -hmm. It protects us from deadly radiation coming from outside. Well, the field today is only 5% the value it was 6,000 years ago. So it started at 100% 6,000 years ago. It decays by 50% every 1,400 years. So at this point, we're only at 5% of the value. What's happening is more and more of that radiation, it's getting closer to the Earth and more of it's getting through. And that's what is affecting us, like with the cancers? That, that, one well. reason, uh, a major reason, right. while cancer rates are going straight up. Not the only one, but it's a major mm. reason. Wow. Uh, are we actually to believe the Bible when it talks about fire-breathing dragons? Well, let, let me make a stipulation. First of all, no animal can create fire inside its body and then breathe it out. No, doesn't happen. However, only on Harry Potter. Yes, even on Harry Potter with smog and all that, whatever his name was. Uh, however, however, if you're observing a creature and it is producing fire in front of its face, in front of the mouth, mm -hmm. your observation is it's breathing fire out. I mean, you know, if you see it in alignment, here's the fire in front of the face, you'd say mm -hmm. it's fire breathing, correct? Okay. That is a biological possibility. There are dinosaurs who have what are called, it's a crusted dinosaur, but it has huge nasal cavity. It starts at the nose, goes way up over the head, turns around 180 degrees, comes back down into the mouth, just as our nose does, which is only that short. Um, those noses would not be needed for smell. You would never need a sinus cavity that long to smell. You know, the, a, a dog with an inch, four inch long nose can smell one part in a billion. Um, those cavities have to be for something else. God doesn't put something there if it's not for a reason. Serious? Oh yes, I'm very serious. Okay. Now, dinosaurs were created as vegetarians. Genesis chapter one, verses twenty-nine and thirty. Meat, not. They not were not meat eaters. Either. They were vegetarians. Even yeah. T-Rexes. And T-Rexes. Now, think about this. Sixteen years ago, next month, evolutionists at the highest level agreed T-Rexes and Velociraptors were vegetarians. All right. Okay. That'll please okay. a lot of people. Many reptiles that are thought to be meteors today, 13 out of 18 species of crocodiles still get 25% of their diet from vegetation. So, the point being though, initially they were all vegetarian. Now, when you eat vegetation and you digest it in the stomach of a creature, and think about an elephant for a second, or a cow, it's anaerobic decomposition. It's decomposition without oxygen you produce methane. Methane is a fuel that you can use. You never light a match at the front or back end of a cow. <laughs> no, that's true. I'm serious. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you lift up the tail of a cow, light a match, you might get a flame four foot long. And you don't want to do it when they burp because it scares the cow half to death. But they produce methanes at both ends, and the same thing is true, people. Right. Now, that's a fuel. If in these sinus cavities you had glands that can secrete chemicals, Every, every biological organism has some arsenic and some phosphorus. It's required for life. I know you think of arsenic as a poison, but you have to have a little to live. What, where does it help you then? Well, it, arsenic is a part of the basic building blocks of biological systems. So you have to have a little arsenic and you have to have a little phosphorus. Now, you don't want too much, but you have to have a little. Okay. Now, if, if a dinosaur, either fighting over, uh, defending itself, fighting, fighting over mates, it's in an agitated mm. condition, then can intentionally excuse the expression belch methane, that's a fuel. Mm -hmm. And that catch fire. At the same token, but it won't set fire by itself, but at the same time, if there's glands in these nasal cavities that can secrete uh, arsenic or diphosphate uh, secretions, when they hit oxygen, they will spontaneously ignite. Oh. So. And so the arsine gas or diphosphane gas breathed out at the same time as the methane's breathed out, this will ignite the fuel and make it appear that there's a fire in front of the face, and you could call them fire-breathing dragons. Mm. And this is an absolute biological reality. Well, I suppose that leads on really to the question that 
dinosaurs, did they exist? Oh, uh, absolutely. At the same time as man? Reptiles that live in the water, reptiles that fly through the air, God tells us we're created on day five. Terrestrial dinosaurs and all other terrestrial reptiles. Now, not all reptiles are dinosaurs, but, but the terrestrial reptiles, including dinosaurs, are created on day six, and the Bible says specifically that that's true. And there are 10 references to dinosaurs after the flood, so they had to be on the ark. After all, God sent one pair of each kind. Dinosaurs are unclean, so he sent one pair of each terrestrial dinosaur on the ark, but there's only 50, 55 kinds of dinosaurs, so that's a 100 to 110 animals. Mm. Not and the deal. average size of a dinosaur apparently is, is so high. It's not if we take a look T-Rex. At the, yeah, if we take a look at the physical evidence of fossils in the ground, that is the result of Noah's flood. So all, all of those died about 4,500 years ago. They represent the dinosaurs that were living prior to the flood in terms of sizes. And the average size today is calculated at 4.7 feet long. Oh, okay. Um, there were a lot of little dinosaurs. Where in the Bible does it mention what you would interpret as dinosaurs? Well, you won't find the word because, of course, it was Sir Richard Owen here in the UK Can't who visit. invented the word in 1841. So you won't find that. But the ancient word for dinosaur is usually dragon. And you will find dragon in many English translations. You'll find it in the Portuguese translation, the Russian translation that I have to use in my mission work. So you're saying George the dra and the dragon and all that? St. George's dragon been, is a yeah. true story. It okay. occurred in the 300s. But there are many other stories of dinosaurs and people living together. Uh, the Canterbury Chronicles, as a matter of fact, of Canterbury Cathedral, 1445, talk about two guys actually watching two dinosaurs, fire breathing, by the way, I think it was, fighting. Um, uh, if you go up to uh, the cathedral at Carlisle, Carlisle. Yeah. You, you have 14... Uh, on 14, the graves. Yes, uh, 1484, they? I think it was, was the mm -hmm. graveside of Richard Bell. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's just here in England. You, you find artifacts uh, in Cambodia, in China, in South America, uh, in the Middle East, at Pompeii, uh, down in the Nile River Valley. Uh, you find pictures or etchings of dinosaurs. Right. Okay. That so match dinosaurs we know from the fossil record. Wow. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just a figure of someone's imagination. It's not imagination mm -hmm. at all. But you see, then, then the scientists of today, world, with a worldview, would actually say, well, yeah, dinosaurs existed, but a long millions of the, years ago. The evolutionist says that they stopped uh, living 65, 70 million years ago. Yeah. But we have the physical evidence of them existing. The, the last known historically reliable report of a person seeing a dinosaur die was in 1883 in Bolivia. Now that, that was published in a respected evolutionary publication still published today. Really? Okay. Why okay. would they? So Why would they not mention that then a bit more uh, rather than just hanging on to, oh, it was millions, of, billions of years old as dinosaurs? Mm -hmm. and make a big thing of that, but not actually say, look, we found one a couple of hundred years ago. Oh, but there's irrefutable evidence. I mean, I've seen some of the art at the Louvre that, that show, clearly shows dinosaurs being etched by people 2,000, 3,000 years ago, mosaics, etc. Uh, on the, on the uh, Ishtar gate at Babylon, they had oxen, they had lions, and they had dragons. Mm. Well, people might think, hang on a sec, with the way that the world's going, that certain species uh, were uh, at fault of bringing their um, demise forever. I mean, we've got problems with some of the uh, African um, animals th that are being hunted, and there's only so many hundred left uh, now. Is it um, some of the well, white the, rhino and, or whatever well, it is? Well, the white rhino's in serious trouble. Yeah. A uh, black rhino is not doing great. Yeah, but I'm saying in a few hundred years, or if, well, if there was a few thousand years left, um, then people would say, well, they lived billions of years ago, but we've got, we got more of a record today. But what we're saying is we do have a record of dinosaurs living. We do. Two or three hundred years ago. Were the, just as we eliminated the dodo mm -hmm. and the carrier pigeon, and that was a human thing, uh, we're now in trouble with gorillas, as you say, white rhinos. But the fact of the matter is, that yes, we are responsible for the demise of some of the dinosaur kinds, but not all of them. That, that nature, in fact, also caused some of them to become extinct too. And so we're not responsible for all of it as a human race. Okay, I've got a question here. As Christians, we need to deal with spiritual warfare, don't we? I indeed agree. 
My, um, in context for a Christian living today with what you've just been sharing, um, why would that be appropriate, do you think? First of all, when, when we as Christians deal with the subject of spiritual warfare, there are probably the, the two single greatest sections of the New Testament dealing with it. They would first go to Ephesians 6. Mm -hmm. you know, put on the helmet of salvation yep. and so forth. Uh, and that's where most people would run to. Mm -hmm. But the second, and I think equally great section of the New Testament dealing with spiritual warfare is in 2 Corinthians. Remind me. Now, now I was going to say, remember what I said earlier too about what, what Jesus said in Mark, quoting Moses, you know, worship the Lord your God with all your mind. Remember, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to ask you, if you would, go to 2 Corinthians 11, verse uh, 3. Paul writes, But I am afraid, lest as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds should be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. 2 Corinthians, sorry, a bit 11, slow. 3. 2 Corinthians 11, 3. Got it. Now, think with me for a second. Is he saying here, I'm afraid uh, that your prayer life isn't all the way up to snuff? <laughs> No, he says, I'm afraid lest the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness. So see, this is where mm -hmm. our minds come in. Your minds should be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ, correct? So he's, what he's saying is, I'm worried about your mind, correct? Turn back one chapter. I, I, I remind people sometimes to get the best understanding of the Bible, you have to read it out of order. So you read 11.3 first, mm -hmm. then go back exactly one chapter. Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and again at verse 3. Mm -hmm. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not work according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not the flesh, but they are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Mm -hmm. Now, that word destruction there uh, and fortresses, think about it. A fortress is a defensive position. He continues, we are destroying speculations. The, the Greek word there, logismos, means reasonings or speculations. And every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought mm -hmm. The word in Greek, neoma, it means device of the mind, uh, captive to the obedience of Christ. We are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. Tell me something. Everything that Paul is describing in chapter 10 occurs between here yes. and here. Yeah, is so that correct? Yes. Now, what he says here, you know, in verse 4, the destruction of fortresses. A fortress is a defensive position. It's no war has ever been... So one faith. through the use of a fort. Mm -hmm. Therefore, what we're talking about here is satanic fortresses because Satan is the one that's on the defense, not us. But when he says destroying speculations, reasonings, every lofty thing or imaginations raised up against the knowledge of God, we're taking every thought, every device of the mind captive. That is all mental. You know, I, I believe in spiritual warfare. I believe in prayer. I believe that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman availeth much. Mm. It's do essential. Then, do you think perhaps this is a, an appropriate time to end because with this? Because we've got so much out there on, on the likes of uh, David Attenborough and the BBC and wonderful programs that they make, but they're always uh, harping on about the evolution uh, theory, as I would call yes. it. Or, well, my stipulation is, first of all, spiritual warfare is 50% mental and 50% spiritual. Yeah. And then we need to educate people to understand that these people are deceivers. They're using stage magic to deceive people into believing a false belief system, a false religion. Evolution is a religion. It is not science. And really, there'd be no point in Christ coming and giving his life for us uh, if you believed in evolution, we've got 14 seconds to answer that. Well, that's just it. Evolution is atheism, pure and simple. That's the definition. Evolution defined is atheism. Okay. Dr. Grady, just thank you so much again for being with us, and especially coming all the way from America to spend time with me in London. Uh, so I'm uh, just uh, hoping that we get you back very, very soon. And until then, uh, God bless you and Nancy to your dear wife. Thank you, sir. Thank You're you so much for all of you joining in with us on the Q&A today. God bless you too. Thanks for your questions.